Good afternoon. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming here. My name's Tom Khalil. I'm the Special Assistant to the Chancellor for Science and Technology. Uh, and I also run the uh, Big Ideas at Berkeley program, which provides support for student-led initiatives in a variety of different ways. Uh, first, we have uh, an annual competition, which we organize in conjunction with the ASUC. Uh, this year, uh, we're giving away $140,000 uh, in prizes. And we got over uh, 115 entries to the different competitions that were, were organized, including the uh, citrus competition. So in addition to the, uh, uh, the annual competition that we do, uh, we also provide uh, small seed grants for student projects. Uh, and we also have an online marketplace for student projects uh, so that alumni and donors can come to the site and make a direct contribution uh, to a particular project. So I just want to let you know about uh, one that's been very successful this semester, a group of students uh, with a $3,000 grant from uh, Big Ideas went and organized um, a student fee referendum uh, to generate $200,000 a year uh, for sustainability projects on the campus, which is the equivalent of a $4 million endowment, uh, because endowments on the campus generate um, interest at 5%. So, so to go from $3,000 to uh, $4 million, this is pretty good leverage. So, so far we're supporting uh, over 40 projects and that number is going to grow with, uh, a, as we add all the projects that are, are going to be winners of um, one or more of these competitions. So uh, there's a lot of people that I would like to thank. Uh, first of all, uh, Annie Ye, who is the one uh, full-time st staff person for uh, Big Ideas, and uh, if you're interested in having your project listed on the Big Ideas Marketplace, um, go up and see her after the meeting, and her, her email is annie.yeh, Y-E-H, at gmail.com. Um, and I want to thank uh, Yvette uh, for doing uh, a terrific job uh, organizing this conference and in uh, getting the word out and uh, nagging the professors until they evaluated the proposals. Uh, and uh, uh, last but certainly not least, I want to thank Sh uh, Shankar for uh, sponsoring the uh, IT for Society uh, competition. So we got, uh, for the IT for Society competition, we got 21 submissions. Uh, six were from uh, UC Santa Cruz, and, and we, have a, we have a team here from UC Santa Cruz as a finalist. Um, and uh, we got so many great uh, responses that uh, we have a number of uh, co-winners uh, and we also added a little bit of money so that we could fund one more proposal. So we're uh, providing a, a total of uh, $29,000 uh, in prizes for the IT for Society competition. And we hope that, uh, that some of your projects start off, may start off as, as relatively small uh, student-led initiatives, uh, but there certainly is a precedent for these becoming the foundation of a much uh, larger scale research initiative. There were a, num a number of uh, student projects in the area of safe drinking water uh, that uh, have served as the foundation for a uh, $200,000 pilot project that's being supported by the uh, Blum Center working on uh, global poverty reduction. So uh, I hope all of you make uh, great progress on your student projects. And now I'd like to uh, turn things over to uh, the director of, of Citrus, uh, Shankar Sastri, to tell you a little bit about uh, Citrus and, and, uh, and what its mission is. So I'm not going to tell you about Citrus, so <laughs> you can be here. I just, uh, you know, we're primarily here to hear about your projects. Uh, let me just add a few words about uh, the student-led projects. You know, I think that the uh, starting with this big ideas competition, I think the f this has been just incredibly important to the lives of the faculty. And the reason it's been incredibly important to the lives of the faculty is because, you know, the projects that are proposed by you are quite frequently uh, the kinds of projects that faculty have felt a little more diffident about proposing because, you know, faculty are burdened down by this, that, and the other, and then. Uh, quite often when we've gone back and we've discussed the projects that have been put forth out here, they'll say, wow, you know, people have proposed uh, this, uh, this project and that project. A and so in a lot of ways, you know, the kinds of things that have been proposed here have been the vanguards. 
the specific sort of safe drinking water things that uh, Tom alluded to may, became the foundations of this Blum Center Safe Drinking Water Project. Uh, last year, some of the projects on uh, uh, on wireless cell phones and you know translation using uh, and gesture recognition and so on on cell phones that became also a pilot for another uh, a project on the Blum Center. So. You know where these projects go is uh, is really anybody's guess, and so uh, I mean to us it's just incredibly important not only to have these be the seedlings, but in some ways they also help us set a fire under ourselves to really uh, push ourselves to think about some new directions. Uh, so Tom talked about the student fee referendum. Of course, he neglected to say that you know the way the student fee referendums collected is an extra tuition that you pay. So uh, by, uh, by, by contrast, you know, uh, this is real money which doesn't come out of anybody's tuition, but through the generosity of the state of California to, uh, to support you. So with that, I'll say that uh, I'm excited to hear the, uh, the presentations. And uh, are you going to talk about the judging process, or this was, that was it? Should I say something about? Uh, y y you know, it's uh, what we tried to do, and you should have a sense of how this was uh, judged. We had four faculty, five faculty, uh, separately read the uh, the proposals and grade them. Uh, and Yvette was very uh, careful about uh, giving them uh, specific areas to grade in, including uh, how competent are you at judging the level, uh, judging this proposal, so that you could evaluate how competent the reviewers were in this. And then after that, uh, she helped sort of bake off the reviews against each other and came up with a list of about uh, six or seven, which were then sort of brought back to this group of five to discuss on the phone. And it's after they discussed it on the phone and they uh, felt that they weren't able to come, they weren't able to make a number of hard decisions that they came back to Tom and asked for extra resources to try to help them uh, get to where they wanted to go. And so that's the reason why uh, more money got added on to the competition this time. And so without further ado, I'm, am I turning it over to you, uh, Yvette? In which order are we going? <laughs> OK, uh, first, first up is the the project on the IT platform to help motorized wheelchair users achieve universal access. And uh, that, is, that project is led by uh, Jesse Lehman. right here so if, if that works fine for everybody um, first of all thanks for uh, voting me one of the top six it's uh, it's an honor um, so I didn't repa prepare any slides because we only have five minutes but um, I did bring my prototype along so I, I, I just wanted to demonstrate what I have already and then explain to you guys what um, improvements I need uh, or, or I have suggested for the I for the citrus department to do so here let me spin around for a second Rear view in the in the screen. Can you guys see yourself? Okay, that's that was the first that was the first element that was um, part of the prototype. Um, that came out of um, uh, having to re reverse out of tight narrow spaces and not wanting to bump into people and furniture. And it started out with a really small screen. And over the years, as technology has gotten better, I've been able to upgrade the screen to a 10-inch screen now. So I can actu it's actually useful out on the road for avoiding faster-moving traffic. So it's a real uh, excellent safety device during the day. And then the next thing that I added, um, why don't you flip the blue switch for me? OK, so those are interior lights so that um, if I'm driving around in a crowded place, like a restaurant or something, people party, yeah. Um, people see me and they don't bump into me and um, here, let me turn around again. Yeah. There's a set of red ones in 
the back. Do you see the red lights in the back? So it's kind of like brake lights, you know, driving out on the street. Okay. All right. Let me switch the blue lights off. And watch out. Flip the uh, orange light here. All right. That's a headlamp, so I can actually, you know, illuminate stuff in front of me, so avoiding potholes and whatnot. Okay. Flip the, uh, yeah. Okay. And then, so I guess you're getting the theme that a lot of this is like a car, you know. Um, and then the final piece, flip the green switch. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys hear it, but I've got some wind. Yeah, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's air conditioning, you know. It's excellent. S especially on a day like today. Yeah. Okay. Okay, go ahead, flip the... All right. So that's the proto... Oh, you should also show how it flips up. Do you know how it flips up the table? Just pull on this edge here. Yeah, pull straight up. Mm -hmm. That's what I do to get out. That This is how I get out of the chair. It flips out of the way, you know. It's very important. Okay, all right, put it down. <laughs> Thanks, by the way, for doing all this. Um, so this is the prototype. And um, there are a couple elements that would really make this something that is useful for all people in motorized wheelchairs. And in particular, I want to add environmental control to it. I don't know if you've heard of that. It's um, where you can control every single device in your home by like a universal remote control. But you can do this with this kind of a device because, oh, here, press, um, can you press S? Mm -hmm. One more time. Let me turn around again. <laughs> All right. So maybe can you guys see the screen now? Now it's a, a laptop interface. So now I can use voice-activated software to do my work wherever I go. <clears throat> but not only that, um, it could serve as an environmental control. So anybody you know having disabilities can press this a button on the screen or talk to it, and it can control any appliance in the house. Um, the second uh, modification that I would like to make with the help of Citrus is um, adding vital sign monitoring. It's something that you guys are already working on, but you can incorporate it into the back of the chair so that if somebody uh, has like a, a drop in um, their heart rate or their breathing is abnormal, we can initiate an emergency call and you know, like it, just like that OnStar system that some cars have, and um, you can incorporate it and ask for help. And um, if no, if there's no response, they could use GPS to come directly to help the person. Um, and then the final um, aspect that I would like to incorporate into the system um, is uh, what was it again? <laughs> It's a new one that just came to me today, so. <laughs> no, this is something that I just thought of, but yeah. I guess I'll get back to you on that one. But yeah, the bottom line is there's plenty of work that needs to be done. And you guys asked what I was gonna do with the prize money, and um, basically it's to get all of the components that are gonna be necessary. And um, I don't know how you guys are gonna deal with um, lab space. I'll have to find a graduate student and you know, maybe a postdoc to work on some of this for me. But uh, all right, that's good. Thank you. Questions? Okay, next up is a, a team from uh, UC Santa Cruz led by Christina Hanel. Christina, come on down. We hope so. <laughs> Is this okay to stand in here? I guess so. We have some people watching in New York too, actually. <laughs> No. <laughs> 
This worked a minute ago. Okay. Um, hi. Thanks for having us here today. We're really excited to be here. Uh, I'm Christina Hamill. I'm a UCSC Feminist Studies student. My interest involved uh, digital media, social enterprise. Yeah, is it on? Can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> Should I start over? There you go. Okay. Hi, thanks for having us here today. I'm Christina Hamill. I'm a feminist studies student at UCSC. My interests include digital media, social enterprise, and community development. Hello, my name is Julie Casso. I am a fourth year anthropology student, and this project complements my interest in social documentation and youth empowerment. The Summer of Service Institute is a collaborative organization by UCSC's Global Information Internship Program and the Center for Multicultural Cooperation. JEEP is a digital service learning program whose members are committed to advancing social justice through innovative technologies. And CMC is a Central Valley nonprofit organization who serves underprivileged youth through promoting civic and social responsibility. Uh, the San Joaquin Valley is one of the most economically depressed regions in the U.S. Only one in three students graduate high school with adequate requirements to attend a four-year university. This is due to a lack of academic counseling and knowledge of the requirements. The Summer of Service Tech Institute addresses these issues head-on. We will be bringing Central Valley youth leaders to UCSC for a week-long introduction to college life. We've arranged workshops with admissions, financial aid, uh, and retention services, and we'll also have student panels um, with university students from the MOG, Latino, and undocumented community. The effect of the institute will extend far beyond their stay in Santa Cruz. The youth leaders will produce multilingual videos about their experiences on campus to be shared with the community, <laughs> as well as recruit two peers into CMC's youth leadership program. We plan to use the Citrus Award money to help fund student housing, lab fees, and video um, supplies. As you can see, this is a worthwhile project, and we are very excited about empowering youth for educational purposes. Thank you for your support. Thank you. <laughs> uh, are there any questions? Next, uh, David Breslauer and his team is going to tell us about telemicroscopy for disease diagnosis. Hello everyone. Hello. Hi, so thanks for having us. I'm here representing the telemicroscopy team. They're all sitting back there. Um, wave everyone. <laughs> so what we're working on is telemicroscopy for a disease diagnosis, diagnosis. So just to give you an overview of what we're doing is we're trying to make a cell phone camera based microscope here. So something that's portable, field ready, you can take it out into the desert, jungle, wherever you want. It's low cost, easy to use. And the idea to build this on a cell phone rather than something, say, like a digital camera, is that you can transmit those images, take the pictures with the microscope, and transmit them back to other facilities where people can look at samples. So if you take a picture of a blood sample, a trained medical technician can look at that sample. So the person on the field doesn't need that kind of medical training. So, just to give you an idea of the utility of light microscopy for clinical work, basically you take a blood sample from a patient and you can mix it with various reagents and dyes. You spread it onto a slide, stick it in a standard light microscope, and you look at it. So this is malaria-infected blood, and these little P's indicated by the P's here, these, that's malarial parasites. So that's the gold standard for diagnosis. And same thing for like sickle cell disease and vitamin B, B12 deficiency. The first step is to look at it under a microscope. So just 
as a more specific example with malaria, this is a malaria parasite affecting a cell. Malaria causes 3 million deaths per year, and 85 to 90% of those deaths are in sub-Saharan Africa. Now, as I said, microscopy is the gold standard for diagnosis of malaria. But in these developing world areas like this, this is the distribution of malaria where it's endemic, the medical facilities are often poorly, uh, have poor equipment, spotty electricity, and then it's hard to have adequate personnel that are well trained in order to diagnose this type of thing. And there are problems with um, preparing malaria specimens that if you're not, don't have a really keen eye, you can often misdiagnose the actual disease. So just to tell you how we're, we're approaching this, if you look at the mobile, worldwide mobile phone coverage, this is just T-Mobile. This isn't singular Sprint, this is just T-Mobile. And this is the world covered coverage of T-Mobile. 90% of the world is expected to have cell phones by 2010, and 81% of those with built-in cameras. And Africa actually has the largest growing cell phone market in the world. So now, just to give you an idea that this isn't just like a neat idea, but this is actually feasible. Just this past February, the US government in the emergency plan for AIDS relief put down $10 million with industry in order to make custom cell phones that have custom software so healthcare workers can enter information about HIV and AIDS patients. It gets transmitted back to the Ministry of Health. All that information is centralized and they can use those statistics to model disease spread, model how patients are doing, and figure out how to stop the spread of disease. So working with a system like this, like this is actually a very feasible idea. So now just to show you what we've been doing and what we want to do with, with uh, any money we win is this is a hydra, so this is a uh, specimen you can buy, and this is actually 10 times magnification that we've gotten on a cell phone using our current setup. Unfortunately, you can't see the contrast well here, but our cell, we have a cell phone mounted on an optical table. So with, this, with the money from this contest, we actually want to make a portable system. So this is the general idea, you, where you can just mount, put the blood on a, on a slide, mount it in an attachment that just clips right on the cell phone, and the software lets you take a picture and transmit it, transmit it back to the facility. So since lenses are expensive and we want to make a self-contained assembly that's rugged and can withstand field use, this money would allow us to investigate like injection molding parts. And standard cell phone lenses are injection molded. We can make cheap lenses and a cheap system. And then hopefully we can actually use this money to travel um, to one of these countries, potentially a country that's supported by the, the government $10 million phones for health program, and see the feasibility of actually taking a picture, transmitting around the world, and can we get a picture and look at it, and can we make an accurate diagnosis? So that's where we're going with this. Um, and I just want to thank some people who helped us out here, Wendy uh, Hansen, who's sitting in the back, and Dr. Ruzben Jafari, the College of Engineering, gave us some seed funding with big ideas. So thank you, Dr. Khalil. And then everyone else who's part of this, the Big Ideas Contest and Bears Breaking Boundaries and Citrus. can you get with a system So right now we've been able to achieve um, 30 times magnification using uh, lenses that we just purchased commercially. Um, we're facing some problems with aberrations um, and trying to actually minimize the system. But we can get a somewhat blurry uh, 30, 30x magnification. We're going actually for next week or once we get the new shipment in for 50 times magnification, which should be sufficient for us to actually see. Um, a, a full red blood cell in a single, single image. Okay. Uh, next up is uh, Anand Kulkarni, who will be talking about uh, an initiative called iCare, which is direct person-to-person -person charity for natural disaster relief. Better? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So hi, I'm Anand Kulkarni, um, along with my partner Ifrat Vitan. Uh, we're going to be presenting the iCare project. The two of us are PhD students in the Department of Industrial Engineering and Operations Research. Um, Urvashi Gupta, who couldn't be here with us today, is our undergraduate uh, research assistant. 
So there was a massive uh, and well-publicized outpouring of uh, public and government aid in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. Uh, but despite the availability of this large amount of money, uh, aid was not delivered to victims in a timely fashion. And many of these uh, failures in traditional disaster relief systems were fairly well publicized uh, by the media. Um, so to give you some idea of the scope of this, this problem, um, about $4.25 billion total was donated by Americans uh, to help Katrina victims. But um, in terms of aid that was wasted by FEMA, almost the entire same amount was uh, unaccounted for due to uh, fraud, uh, waste, theft, and other, other causes. And this was something that most Americans were aware of. Um, almost half of, uh, over half of Americans felt their biggest concern when they were donating was that their donations wouldn't get to the people who needed the donations the most. Uh, and other people thought that through donating cash, their donations would be wasted on unnecessary goods. Um, however, one interesting phenomenon that was observed in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina um, was that people who were unable to uh, donate money or unwilling to donate money found effective alternate channels on the internet to, uh, to connect with people who needed help directly. Um, so for example, you had about 300 million page views in the first uh, two weeks after the storm to a local Louisiana blog that was being used as the point of access for people who were organizing, uh, organizing ad hoc support. Um, and other, other places people would look were places like Craigslist, um, KatrinaInfo.net, and other uh, sort of grassroots user-created sites that, um, that were trying to fill the gap that was left by traditional uh, relief, relief agencies and systems. So uh, the one drawback of these systems is that they weren't built to, to handle this. Um, web logs and the, the open source people finder project um, weren't designed with this, with this idea in mind. So this is where uh, iCare comes in. Um, the iCare project is an effort to, uh, is an IT-based uh, web service that directly pairs donors and victims of a disaster uh, during the uh, 36 hours to six months after a disaster. Uh, there are three components to the site, um, depending on uh, which group you fall in. So disaster victims communicate with the iCare system by reporting their needs either via uh, SMS text messaging on cell phones or by uh, communicating on uh, internet terminals that are rolled out in the aftermath of a natural disaster. Uh, second, individuals and companies identify via the website which specific victim needs they're best suited to meet via an in-kind donation. Um, second, or the third part uh, is our technological uh, secret sauce, which is that we uh, will automatically figure out a way to ship the goods from the donor to the victim using surplus and donated space on existing transportation networks. Um, so this is a, an algorithmic challenge. So in doing so, we avoid many of the failures of traditional disaster relief systems that were seen after Hurricane Katrina. Uh, for example, because we're donating uh, goods directly, we avoid the potential for, um, a, uh, for loss due to fraud. We avoid the overhead costs associated with uh, traditional disaster relief giving. And we also avoid the uh, transaction cost that's implicit in converting funds from, uh, well, converting funds to goods. So people are more willing to donate goods than money. Uh, we only ship items directly when people need them. People are more willing to donate a wider range of items do, uh, as opposed to money. We have a lower overhead cost. And uh, we have a higher level of user confidence in the donation process because um, donors are seeing the direct impact of uh, the, the goods and uh, services they're giving. Um, and we also have ideas on how to extend this for use as part of a national release policy by incorporating data management features and other aspects that would be useful to uh, nonprofit organizations. So this was developed in 2006 uh, by Efrat and myself. Uh, we picked up a, uh, a prize that uh, uh, inspired us to, to kick this off from uh, the Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology on campus. Um, we're launching in fall 2007. Uh, right now, technological development is underway, and we're also working on some of the theoretical aspects with our undergraduate staff um, on things like disaster modeling and disaster relief models. Uh, we're also pursuing partnerships with groups like FEMA and the Red Cross. Uh, and any funds that we get through Citrus are going to be used to uh, extend the service in terms of expanding our infrastructure and our ability to handle very large numbers of page requests and also uh, to, to fund uh, one or two undergraduate coders to assist us with the project. 
Um, and our website is going to be at icare.iur.berkeley.edu. Um, so thanks. And I should note that Anand and Efrat were also winners of last year's uh, competition for a course on uh, mathematical modeling. That's right. So, uh, what one what, one question I had is, uh, you know, you said that one of the benefits uh, associated with this is reducing fraud. Mm -hmm. um, as a potential donor of an in-kind service, how do I know that the person on the other end really needs that service and isn't? Uh, you know, just using a, right. so, so uh, uh, you know, a, a disaster to, to try to uh, play on my sympathies. So this is a question that actually we get a lot. Uh, and it's something that we've tried very hard to build protections into the system uh, that would, would account for it. The most fundamental protection that you have as a donor is the fact that um, the types of goods and services that people are likely to be requesting and that you should be agreeing to give are not things like big screen televisions. Mm -hmm. They're things that are less likely to be targets of fraud, um, such as basic relief supplies. The other aspect of it is that we have some built-in protections against fraud uh, into the system in terms of uh, users, users on the victim's end giving information about themselves, IP tracking, um, a reputation system if people are repeatedly using the system, um, and then the fact that we can actually track the package that goes directly to the person up to the final handoff. So there's some accountability. Uh, all the way through the process. Could you require some authentication on the the recipient side? In, the, in, in a technological sense, you mean? Yeah, also, um, I mean, requiring that someone <coughs> log on, you know, give their name and address and things sure. like that so as that's, opposed to a pseudonym. That's also a possibility. Have we yeah. talked about about adding that? We have. We have a list of, of anti-fraud, uh, some of which we have not implemented yet, and I guess that's one of them. Great. Thanks. Okay, uh, next up is, uh, is Scott Zimmerman here and uh, Chris Jones. Okay, so uh, Chris Jones is going to talk about interactive life cycle assessment tools uh, for consumer led, uh, uh, consumer level goods and services. And, and this is uh, working on reducing your carbon footprint. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, as, as much as I wish that I, I, I were Scott, actually, I'm not Scott, uh, I'm, I'm Chris Jones. Scott is one of the, the uh, many uh, graduate students that we've had working on this project, and I'm going to show on Scott's behalf uh, one of the slides that he's been working on. Um, and here we go. And on a day like today, I guess I don't have to talk too much about uh, global warming, uh, and also because we're, we're very much aware of, of uh, this <laughs> issue uh, in here in Berkeley. Uh, I'm staff researcher at the Berkeley Institute of the Environment, and uh, this project has involved uh, um, uh, actually about 20 graduate students, and 20 students uh, including five undergraduates and 15 graduate students. The, most, the ones who've worked specifically on um, the tools that I'm going to describe today are, are, are mentioned uh, here. Uh, and uh, faculty support is provided by uh, Arpad Horvath and uh, Professor Dan uh, Kamen. So the basic research question is, well, what is the impact of household consumption on the environment? Something, a question that anyone who is interested in the environment um, will quickly ask uh, themselves, um, and something that guides my research on a daily basis. So um, quickly I came to the realization as a graduate student in the Energy and Resources uh, program that in order to understand uh, and, and be able to answer this question, we, I needed to look at a life cycle assessment approach. Um, and we've developed um, through um, uh, several, through a research program at the Berkeley Institute of the Environment, also uh, in uh, courses uh, with uh, Arpad Horvath, and uh, several other um, emerging projects that have developed from this one. Uh, three tools that I'm going to describe uh, very briefly today. LEAF is the primary tool. Uh, we call this the Life Cycle Environmental Assessment and Footprinting Tool. It's a life cycle assessment of uh, that produces greenhouse gases and criteria air pollutants right now of 1,100 categories of goods and services that households buy. Anything that anyone can buy, uh, we have an, an emissions estimate of greenhouse gases and also uh, air pollution. Eventually, we'll have other things in the model as well. And we produce these estimates on a CO2 equivalent per dollar, and um, we actually have an equivalent per gram of product. So you can think of a gram of, of carbon and a gram of product and be able to weigh and evaluate these 1,100 products. 
Um, we do this through the production, um, through refining, uh, mining, manufacturing of the products. In addition, uh, life cycle system of the transport from the manufacturer to the point of sale, and we also have emissions from uh, retail. These are all based on the average uh, U.S. Um, emissions. So these are of these 1,100 categories on average what the emissions that you would get. And eventually, this model, we would be able to use this to, um, if we know where the, the item is purchased or we know where it's sold, because there's different energy mixes of those locations, be able to adjust the model. So um, I'm actually, these are, of the 1,100 categories, here's 30-some uh, of them. Um, I just wanted to point out with this slide is that um, emissions on a per dollar basis range anywhere from 100 and some grams per dollar all the way up to, in this category, um, two kilograms or more per dollar. <laughs> and this, this data actually hides a lot of important information. So um, what we'd like to do is be able to put this in an online format and uh, allow people to be able to drill down and dig down and figure out what is the relative impact of, of my consumption? So here we have uh, um, drilled down for food. Uh, and you can see what you might expect is that uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, only looking at greenhouse gases here from uh, dairy and meat, produce a lot, are a lot more embodied carbon is in, are in those um, things that you can purchase compared to Things like coffee and tea, this is actually a reflection of the price, so coffee is more expensive, so on emissions per dollar basis, uh, it appears to be less. Um, and what's, it is interesting to look at these and compare them on a gram per gram basis. But let's say we want to dr drill down a little bit deeper uh, for, um, for meat in particular. So the model, again, digging down deeper into the model, uh, we can see that uh, beef produces more than you might expect for um, chicken. Uh, interestingly, game, uh, if, I guess if you go out and kill the, the mm -hmm. animal yourself, you, clearly there's less fossil fuels, uh, maybe something for Michael Pollan's next book. Um, but again, you can imagine all the things that go into producing uh, an animal for, for consumption, right? The, the fertilizers, the food. And this model is a boundaryless model. It actually also incorporates the pens and the computers that the executives are using in their trips around the world. It is a, complete uh, life cycle assessment, actually. So you might also want to think about the emissions that come from the cleaning supplies if you're having this meal. Imagine Michael Paul in there, right? Um, you know, the, the emissions that come from uh, producing the things that the, the table and the chairs and the glassware and the dishes, and um, you know, we can include the whole thing. So, so applications of this, uh, we're looking at uh, going, uh, uh, partnering with uh, organizations to go directly to retailers. So you can imagine carbon neutral shopping, where you'd be able to buy your food at Whole Foods, and everything that you buy at Whole Foods would be carbon neutral. So we can use offsets, um, something that I won't go into great detail here, but um, you can imagine uh, going shopping and, and either through a, a point of sale or online uh, be able, being able to offset the emissions from your purchase. Um, consumers can actually also pr pr purchase carbon offsets in a voluntary market right online right now. And uh, producers could use this as baseline information for determining their, their uh, climate footprint of products. The second tool, just briefly, is a climate footprint calculator. Some of you may have seen this. It's on the BIE website. Um, this isn't the live version here, but I just want to show you one screenshot. You can go in for transportation, housing, food, goods, or services. It estimates your emissions based on the typical household. And a lot of the graduate students that we had working on this last semester uh, were looking at, well, what if I live in the Bay Area? Let's look justice for local energy mix, local prices, um, and local consumption behavior. So the next version uh, will hopefully be able to do that. It's one of the main things that we want to be able to do. Um, this is, you might think for the average household, this is how we spend our money in these uh, bins here, transportation, housing, food, goods, and services. Those are emissions per dollar. And when you multiply that, this is what you get. So for a typical household, uh, the green are indirect emissions and from the, that we get from this life cycle assessment model. And the blue is what you typically would get from a tr traditional calculator, right? My direct emissions from burning fossil fuel or from powering my home. But when you consider the full life cycle, you actually get more emissions from the life cycle than you do from the, the direct emissions. What would it take to reduce my emissions by 50%? You might have to do something like this. Or if you wanted to live at the global level, 
And we'll do this here from here to here. Um, so what we'd like to do is produce informational tools on a website that can provide uh, people uh, information that can uh, show the equity considerations of this. By the way, if everybody lived like this, um, we would have the existing climate problem, right? We need to reduce emissions by 80% below that and show the scale of the problem. And it's why uh, I believe that working with uh, produce, excuse me, working with um, on the um, top-down and bottom-up strategies are appropriate. The last thing I want to show you is a mission. This is actually uh, Scott Zimmerman did uh, this slide here. This is our climate footprint of UC Berkeley that we have done uh, without the life cycle assessment. Um, when you add the life cycle assessment, it's quite a different story, right? This is again the direct and indirect emissions from emissions from transportation, from procurement of everything the university consumes. So this is our footprint, even though we might only register a portion of those. Um, climate footprint of the top 28 cities is another project we're doing. Um, the last thing I'd like to say is you can use these this for um, figuring out the environmental footprint. So multiplying uh, a, a, the emissions that you get by a dollar of societal cost so that people actually get sick from these emissions and there are climate implications of um, that have real, you could put a dollar value on them, right? Um, you might think about taxation and so forth. So there's a lot of ways that we want to uh, move this forward, develop m online tools and uh, get this information directly to uh, households, consumers and uh, retailers. Thank you. Any questions for Chris? Uh, we have, of those 20 students, none of them have been paid, and we have done no marketing, and we have uh, written no proposals, so um, we've got a long ways to go. Well, we, we've done none. Yeah. And in fact, none of these tools have been released even online. Uh, there's a few models that are available, but um, we haven't published the data yet, so uh, we're trying to do it step by step. Um, but we would look for um, have some, if you have some ideas. I <laughs> certainly appreciate that. Uh, Donna. Uh, um, for, for all the material and resources given, you've got some things being produced in Romania, some things in China, some in Thailand, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and knowing the cost of goods for those plastics, and right. I mean, it's an incredible feat to get all that data. Very good question. Uh, this all assumes U.S. emissions. Uh, so if it's produced uh, overseas, we assume that it's uh, produced under the same uh, manufacturing processes as in the United States. It's an assumption. Uh, there are a lot of assumptions in the model. Certainly that's a, an important one. Um, only about 10% of our economy is imports and exports about, right? So five and between 5 and 10% is import and export. So. Um, there are other other issues in the model, and that's one of them. So. Yeah. Uh, two quick comments. The first is that uh, I noticed in your life cycle that degradation wasn't part of the that's right. the, yes. the component. It seems like there might be a pretty significant component of uh, the life cycle there. Um, the second is that it seems that if people are interested in sort of carbon neutral living, mobility for this sort of information would be particularly useful, uh, sort of like reading product labels. Uh, right, you should right. effectively be able to calculate it or look at it with right. your uh, sort of yeah. a, you know, look at what the label says right. and be able to really say what it is that you're buying. So maybe a, a right. cell phone based approach might be the way to it's go. A, it's a great suggestion. I know there's another group on campus that's working on that end of it, and we definitely like to link with them, our, our Dara Works group. And um, on the first question, we've only done air, uh, greenhouse gas emissions and criteria pollutants right now. Eventually, uh, it's actually not. Um, difficult to add in uh, other environmental impacts. So you could look at land use. Um, degradation is a bit hard to, to, to measure, right? So you, you some data um, problems with that. But so we want to look at that as well. So. Okay. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Is Ben Bellows here? I am. All right. right. Okay, so uh, Ben is going to be talking about coupling output-based aid and, uh, and mobile technologies. Uh, and, and if you think about just some of the uh, potential permutations of just seeing some of the projects that we've seen, we might have peer-to-peer -peer based output uh, aid as, w as well. That's so. something that we were actually discussing last year. Um, 
And when we get it more developed, we'll go that way. Let me start at the beginning here. Um, all right, so I wanted to quickly tell you two stories today, both about an old public health problem, a proposed public health solution, and how that induced an old technology problem, and then some proposed uh, technology solutions. The, um, the old public health problem is one of reproductive health disease burdens. In places like Uganda, where I'm currently doing my dissertation research, the reproductive health burden of disease is class of diseases like uh, STIs, including HIV, uh, like maternal mortality, morbidity, the, the disability associated with deliveries, um, represent the single largest class of disease and, uh, and death in the country. You have others, pulmonary, traffic accidents, that sort of thing, but this uh, class of disease is certainly one of the largest. So the solutions that we proposed to alleviate that disease burden came out of all of these various centers on campus. Individuals have been working on these problems for a very long time. Now, uh, one of the classic ways in which you can alleviate disease burden, of course, is to strengthen the public health infrastructure. What that has met from the donor perspective is that the, the donor, typically USAID, or in this case, the German Ministry of Finance, KFW, approach their government recipient on their, their analog in Uganda. They go to the Ministry of Health. That's great for a large number of the users, but it doesn't capture all of your healthcare users in the system. There's a large sector, the private sector, that gets left out of that exchange. And so KFW, the German Ministry of Finance in this case, recently began developing, based on ideas that were actually uh, first presented here at Berkeley, on contracting in the private sector. This is an output-based aid uh, model in which the contract stipulates certain uh, outputs that we expect from the provider in return for a fee. It's a negotiated fee for service. There are certain uh, criteria that get built into that, both prior to becoming a member to that network and then once they are members uh, to meet compliance. The interesting piece of this is that we sell vouchers. So there's both a contract piece of this, one pillar of the program, and a voucher that gets distributed, socially marketed, into the general population. So we try and target symptomatic cases or probable cases based on information about, well, if you think you have an STI, these are the conditions that you would want to seek care. I'm sorry, I'm getting some confused looks, so I'll slow down here. But um, basically, we are trying to screen individuals who think they may have an STI. They buy the voucher for the equivalent of 3,000 shillings, which is about $1.60 US. This is good for the client, the person buying it, as well as their partner. So it's an innovative approach to bring in both the person who clearly thinks they're at risk and somebody they think they may have transmitted the, <coughs> excuse me, the infection to. This comes included with the brand as well as a barcode sticker, which could be a, one of many different mechanisms to guarantee the authenticity of the voucher. How the system works then, this proposed public health solution, is we don't have arrows, but beginning up here at the top with the management agency, the voucher essentially flows through community distributors. These are people who know individuals in the community. They are known as public health providers are typically drug, uh, drug shop representatives or small mom and pop operations. They sell the vouchers at a 10% commission. The patients then take this voucher and present at clinics. Now this part of the process takes on average about 15 days. This, this project was actually launched in July of 2006. It takes on average about 15 days in our first eight months of data for the voucher to go from the point of issue to the client, to the patient. We have now had 5,700 patients treated and about 10,000 vouchers, these are double vouchers, sold in this population. The bottleneck that we've discovered is that from the patient back through the clinic and back to the management agency takes on average 30 days and a max of two months. So that is where we're seeing some slowdown. The principal bottleneck in that process is here between the clinics and the management agency. And that has to do a lot with standardization of care. We're dealing with private providers. They have acted autonomously. They've been on their own. They haven't had any sort of oversight regulation other than an occasional um, uh, regulatory visit from Ministry of Health. And so there hasn't been this standardization of care that you'd like to see and that you do see in public sector health. So what happens is the claims get submitted to MicroCare and Mario Stopes, the management agency at the top, they're not completed properly, they're delayed, sometimes the providers batch them. Essentially, it's an information breakdown. It's an information breakdown on paper. So what do we do? I was talking with friends of mine at TIER, I was talking with friends of mine at Computer Science and in the iSchool and other places. The solution, smartphones. So we move from this public health problem and solution to a new presentation, this iterative process, and we think, well, maybe there's an, I, there's an IT solution to this process. So smartphones. 
Smartphones essentially bring us or give us the same uh, level of functionality that you find obviously with, with stationary computers, but you bring with it a class of mobility. So we can run any number of, these are window-based machines, um, I'm actually discussing some of them earlier today, but uh, they, you can run a number of different applications on them, very useful. The reason we picked them out, of course, is that cell phones are widely recognized in, in many of these settings. We've heard another project today, in fact, where, again, because of the portability, it's an ideal solution. So they're offering, in this case, a, a technology solution to our, to our paper-based problem. We're getting immediate validation of the data. You can build in algorithms to make sure that you're not getting, for instance, treatment of vaginal discharge, um, talking STIs here, but uh, uh, for, for male patients or other kind of illogical sorts of solutions um, or, or data entry issues. You get um, relevant questions for, for um, uh, relevant, rather um, relevant questions based on previous answers, and so you're reducing your, your data error, you're improving your data quality, you're adding, of course, GPS information, you can add in audio support, you can do uh, photo-based uh, record keeping. Uh, there are other issues around this, uh, smartphones you can bring in um, even in areas where you obviously don't have connectivity, you can later synchronize with these systems. So these are all solutions, these are all building on uh, this output-based aid model and providing solutions for what was a paper-based problem. So we are going to run this pilot later this summer in September, beginning with uh, some initial studies in July and uh, May, well, yeah, beginning later this month, June and July. And basically these are our criteria roughly, roughly uh, stated if we can improve the routine delivery of care, the routine data we're getting out of this, we know we've done a good job. If we're able to reduce the administrative burden, we know we're doing a good job. And if we can increase this payment, getting that payment system back to the providers more quickly, we know we've done a good job. So that's essentially the program. You can check out our website for more information about what we're doing currently with output-based aid. And I uh, wish to thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions for Ben? Are you part of the program? Um, no, not currently. But I do have friends and colleagues and members of this proposal who are part of the Bloom Center, yeah. But there's no Blum Center activity in Uganda then? Well, there is a Blum Center activity in Nakaseke, I think, in one part of Uganda, but I'm not involved with that. Can you go back to your uh, your flowchart of all the players uh, in, in this issue? So uh, I, it sounds to me that there are multiple problems. Uh, the first is, uh, in effect, this is sort of uh, providing a subsidy for public health so that people will actually go get treated for the problems that they have. Correct. Uh, is that right? And then the second is that you want the clinics to treat them, so in effect the insurance is paying them. And there's a, also the secondary problem of, of remittance of the money that right. they're actually due. Those are the those the are the problems. principal problems, yeah. So the, the devices are actually helping the clinics to get good data, not necessarily the people, right? I mean, that, the devices are going to the clinics. Right. I should clarify that. So that the user then is a highly educated healthcare provider. Okay. It's not your general population. And it allows then for that information to get from the provider back to the management agency. So it, it makes the entire system more efficient, yeah. Uh, so, so two questions then. The first is, um, have you looked at tagging the actual vouchers uh, with barcoding or whatever the case mm -hmm. may be to s simply figure out which one was used when and where. And the second th is a much larger question of uh, multiple partners that could be infected, right. even though this only promotes sort of uh, taking right. the one, which in and of itself is important. Right. Um, yes, we have looked at ways of tagging the voucher. In fact, we did um, build in a space here, and we do use barcodes to uniquely identify it. On the claims form, which is I didn't include that here, but I could throw that up or we could talk about it later. When the provider submits a claim back to the management agency, agency they include the voucher itself as well as a thumbprint on a single sheet of uh, explaining what the patient's history was, the diagnosis, and any potential treatment that they received. So the thumbprint then, although it's not currently used because they haven't got the system yet in place, again, it's only an eight-month-old program, um, it will be used for fraud control making sure we're not getting duplicate thumbprints on 50 or 60 different claims forms coming in. So that's another place where this cell phone, again, given its abilities to take imagery uh, and deal with, with digital images, would be very useful for recognition. Um, as far as multiple, multiple patients and getting the multiple partners out of this, we recognize that as an issue. Um, 
and are exploring it down the road, but that's not something we can do right now. We want to get the management piece up and running first. Great. Thank you. So we've heard from the six uh, proposals, and we had uh, the judges had a very difficult time figuring out who would get what prize, which is why we got extra cash. We had two co-winners for the third prize, and the projects are the Eye Care Direct Person-to-Person -person Charity for Natural Disaster Relief, and Developing Interactive Lifecycle Assessment Tools for Consumer-Level Goods and Services. And both of these projects will receive two thousand dollars each. So let's have the the Eye Care people and the. which receives $3,000. The project is the information technology platform to help motorized wheelchair users achieve universal access. So congratulations. By the way, uh, Jesse, I also heard your desire for a, uh, for a lab. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, we have the person for you. Uh, Rujna Baichi, I think, is the uh, Professor Baichi. Uh, she has an office up. She has a lab up here on the fourth floor. Is it accessible? No. Do we have Do we have an elevator in this building, by the way? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I, I, we, we need to introduce him to uh, Ruse Bay. Actually, Ruse Bay, the same Ruse Bay that uh, David talked about. Yeah. Don't you think Ruse Bay is a guy for him? Oh, yeah. We have uh, a special prize for best use of IT for rural America, and that project goes to the Summer Service Technology Institute, and that's a $5,000 prize. So congratulations. And the judges could not decide who would get first prize, so we have co-first prize winners who will receive $8,500 for their projects. We have telemicroscopy for disease diagnosis and uh, coupling output-based aid in mobile technologies. Congratulations, you guys. Come on up.